Well, I was in my uh, senior year of high school in uh, Rutherford, New Jersey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like you, when you have spare time, you read comic books. And there was a comic book out by a cartoonist, and this guy was named Smiling Jack. And he was a barnstormer, and he flew uh, all over the country and landed in fields and took people up for a ride uh, for about a dollar, I think, at the time. And uh, I didn't have the dollar, and I never had the opportunity to go up with Smiling Jack. So I vowed that uh, when I got the opportunity to fly, I would be a flyer myself. Uh, I was trying to get into the Army Air Corps. It was the Army Air Corps at the time. So I, but I had to take a two-year college equivalency test um, in order to get into the Army Air Corps. And um, I was able to take this test and pass as a civilian. So I, um, from the recruiting station in Newark, they sent me, uh, it was quite a trip, to, uh, uh, overnight trip to Bluxy, Mississippi. Uh, and um, it was like an overnight trip and uh, they sent me uh, on a Pullman car, um, which I had an experience on the Pullman train going down uh, after I passed Washington, D.C. Uh, the car immediately became segregated and uh, they, the Pullman porter uh, pulled me over to the side and told me, look, son, next time you come into the dining car, I had these meal tickets to, for my trip all the way down, <laughs> and I was determined to not get there with them not being used. So the, the next time you come into the dining car, son, uh, we'll have to pull a curtain around you because uh, sometimes a, a train going north and a train going south have to go in around a mountain or a lake. It will have to pull off on a siding. And if they see you sitting in this white dining car, uh, they may take a shot at you. Well, I uh, let them pull the curtain around me, and I ate. <laughs> After about a week's time, they put me on another train, still in my civilian clothes, and um, sent me to Tuskegee, where this experimental program was uh, in force. When I got there, the, the, the program, experimental program was already in progress. And the fellows uh, who were there ahead of me, because I was not the first one to get there, explained to me that uh, this is an experimental program. Uh, they don't think that uh, we will be able to learn how to fly. And if we learn how to fly, they don't think that we'll fight. And if you feel that way, get your hat. In other words, don't bother trying. Right. <laughs> so that, that was the most inspirational thing that happened to me. Uh, you know, just any kid, and I, I considered myself a kid at that time, if you told me you can't do something, he's going to show you. I was, I, it, it just made me determined to show him, and I carried that determination all through my training overseas and back <laughs> uh, uh, to, to just prove the point that uh, I could do anything anybody else could do. The sad part about it, um, out of a class of around 100, um, I think my class was a little larger than that, only 20 of you would graduate. They had some wholesale, uh, they call it washout, elimination rates. And um, fellows who had the same ambition and uh, spirit and, that I had, uh, and some fellows uh, who I knew had previous flying uh, ability uh, that made me fearful that I would be one of the ones that walked out and they would make it. Uh, uh, they, they were, some of those were eliminated. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it was because of uh, lack of ability. I think it was because uh, without saying so, they had a quota system that on, out of every class that came through, we were only going to graduate a certain percentage. I had a little problem myself, uh, and I think it was uh, basic training. Uh, I made uh, what you call a bad landing. Now pilots call any kind of landing. You walk away from a good, a good landing. Uh, but uh, I bounced around a little bit, and uh, my instructor got out of the plane and called, they call you by your last name. It's span. Before you graduate, you're going to crack up one of these planes. 
And uh, I said, and I bet you a carton of cigarettes. Cigarettes were high priority then, those days, and that was a big bet. And he bet me a carton of cigarettes, and I said, bet. And I took his challenge. And at graduation, he told me, you know, remember that time? If you didn't take that bet, you would be the next one on my washout list. I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> I flew uh, uh, from the, when I got to Ramatulli to our uh, air base. I was able to fly uh, in all 26 combat missions. Now they were two kind of missions. Um, uh, I flew mostly high altitude bomber escort missions, but I was able to get in about six reconnaissance missions. The difference between high altitude. Uh, uh, escort mission is you have a lot of planes, your planes helping you to escort the bombers. But the reconnaissance missions, you just take you and another plane and you rendezvous or you uh, meet up with a uh, plane that came from England with a camera. He didn't have any guns. And then you drop down to low altitude right over the treetops and take photos of where he wanted or was assigned to take photos. And then it was quite a thrill uh, when you get down the low altitude and you can see the farmer shaking a pitchfork at you. And uh, you're ready to uh, get out of there, but this guy taking the pictures, he had two more pictures to take here and there. <laughs> and you, your job was to stay with him until he got all his shots. I, I was proud uh, to see the change in attitude um, that came about about the Tuskegee Airmen in general. Uh, when we had an opportunity to go to town um, and we met some of the bomber crews in town, uh, they always gave us all the praise in the world. Uh, you Red Tails, we want you guys to uh, escort us. And uh, you guys do a good job escorting us. And that's a big change about from when I was in training. And they hardly wanted you to even learn how to fly. Yeah. And um, I think that, that uh, attitude and, and show and how we proved we could act under fire um, had a great deal to do with the beginning of the desegregation in the country. Every little bit helped, and I thought we played a big part in it. So to tell the story about the Tuskegee, I mean, you had to tell about the part where we were abused and, uh, and not uh, treated fairly. And it's been a slow move trying to get people to actually say it. And, uh, and uh, the main people are congressmen to actually admit it, that uh, such a thing could happen, where you came home to meet this discrimination in spite of your abilities. When I get an opportunity to tell a story to schools, I like to talk to the youngsters and tell them that we were able to succeed because in high school we had a basics uh, and took our mathematics and our science. And if you're going to be in the Air Corps, uh, it's necessary. Uh, I believe uh, when I was in the school, they said, oh, you don't need that, but uh, you do need it. And I want them to make sure that uh, if they're good students, for the most part, they will be able to make it through.